about it today is um, some work that we've done on looking at how stormwater control measures can mitigate high temperature inflows, which of course is a big problem in the urban environment. So the goal here, um, the goal of the research was to see if we could turn the heat miser into the cold miser, right, to see whether we could take that hot stormwater that comes into our stormwater control measures and then have it leave and be cooler, okay, maybe not cold, but cooler than it was before. So this is important to us for a number of reasons, um, the biggest of which is that fish don't like hot water, right? So again, coming back to some very basic ideas, fish don't like hot water. Um, and one of the major reasons why is because as you have higher temperatures, you have less oxygen in the water, and then the fish suffocate and die. And so that's not a, a good thing for fish. Um, it also kind of disrupts things like their uh, reproduction cycles. It makes it so that they're less tolerant of other stressors because they're already stressed from temperature. And then also what it can do is increase the rate of algal growth, which can be problematic also for dissolved oxygen in the water. So um, there's some research that's occurred in the past uh, looking at using um, basically a heat transfer model uh, to see if we can really mathematically model uh, this transfer of the hot uh, energy from the water into the cool uh, stone bed or into the cool um, soil that you have underneath of your various stormwater control measures. So this prior research basically found that stormwater control measures or BMPs are pretty effective at cooling down the hot stormwater. And we wanted to see whether this research that was done on rain gardens could also then be applied to a stone bed that's underneath of some pervious pavements that we have here on campus. So this is a lot of data. The, the big thing to take away here is that um, if we look at the cold water fishery information that we have from Pennsylvania, so this is the Pennsylvania code, uh, we see that we're allowed to have different temperatures depending on whether we expect the fish to be trout, whether we expect them to be cold water fish, or whether we expect them to be warm weather fish. And we wanted to see how, how our outflows compared to these values just so we could figure out where we were in relation to the requirements of the state. So this is the site that we took a look at, and you're going to probably see this on your tour today. And this was a retrofit that was done behind an existing building on campus. Uh, the short story on why we ended up at this site is that the funding agency that provided the funds to build this requires that we can pretty much guarantee that it's going to stay in place for at least 20 years. When we looked at the campus, the large parking lot where you all pulled into probably, uh, that is actually slated for development at some time in the future. Thank God, because it's hideous. Um, and so we didn't want to build there, right? And then we also wanted to build somewhere that had faculty parking. Those faculty have crappier cars than the students. Um, that's part of the reason, but also that it also guarantees us year-round parking. And those were our key criteria. When you think about how you would normally site a stormwater control measure in real life, uh, you would think about things like what's the infiltration capacity of the soils, um, all of that stuff, right? That was secondary to us um, because these were more important factors for us to consider. So we picked this lot because we were pretty much down to this lot, filled all those criteria. And it's behind the science building. So this is the Mendel Science Center. Um, this is the green roof, or I'm sorry, this is the greenhouse, rather. It's not a green roof. It's not a green roof, I'm sorry, greenhouse. Um, and then this is the R5 train line. So that'll give you some perspective as you go walking around. So the site pretty much accepts runoff from these two adjacent conventional asphalt parking areas, and they go into the permeated concrete on the side, of course, and asphalt on that side. And um, they can accept about five centimeters of rain. Um, it was sized just based on the geometry of the site. So it's a sloping site. So this corner down here is the minimum depth that we could make it to keep the bottom flat, then we just went straight back. So the volume was actually backed into it. We didn't design the site to necessarily hold that volume, um, but it 
turns out to be a good amount of rain, that it can hold about 90% of all the rain that falls in this region will be captured and stored on this site. And actually, our hydrologic monitoring kind of proves that to be the case, because we only see a couple overflows here. So this is a cool composite picture showing you what the whole thing looks like. So we've got uh, the pervious concrete on this side, coarse asphalt on this side. We've got a geotextile here to separate the gravel that's here um, from the natural soils underneath. And then you don't see it over here, but there's an overflow. And the water that overflows from here then goes into the conventional stormwater system, which then actually ends up in our constructive stormwater wetlands. So this is was sort of the beginning of us having our stormwater control measures connected together because we'd finally gotten to the point where we had enough of all that that was happening. So these signs uh, that say no parking before 8 a.m., that's because we have first flush samplers that are back over here and our students need to be able to get to them um, after a rain event. And the only way that we found that we could do that is if our students got there by 7.45, they could pop it off, get our samples out, and then people could park there. Um, otherwise, they were crawling underneath the cars, which wasn't so great. Um, doesn't look good either. No, it doesn't look good at all. So we had temperature measurements that we took that we connected to these signs. So the signposts actually came completely in handy for us because we were able to attach a temperature sensor to them to basically get a surface temperature right above the pavement. We then had temperature readings that we took in the bed here, and then we had the surface temperature, or the air temperature from the Mendel roof, which if I go back here, this was, there's a uh, weather station right over here, and we were able to get the air measurements from that. So in essence, what happens is that you know, when it's really hot, of course you have the pavements heating up, and then the water hits that hot pavement, picks up the energy from that, and ends up in our stormwater control measure. And what we hope that's going to happen, and what actually did happen, was that this stone actually is has so much capacity to absorb that heat that it just took all the heat right out. And we never really saw a change in the temperature of that stone bed because it was so big compared to the water that was going in. So I just described this to you. We have the runoff going in. Here are our first flush samplers. We also have the ability to take temperature here and then temperature in the beds. So we've got temperature um, over here from, in the air up at the roof. And then, as, as I mentioned, this is the signs. This is what we use, these little cool devices called eye buttons, little interesting stories. They were really developed to monitor the temperature of eggs because there's concerns about whether <coughs> eggs can uh, once they get above a certain temperature, then it's not healthy for human consumption. And that's really where these got their start. And they were so convenient because you could just throw them in the back of the truck, pull them out, and make sure that the temperature in the truck had stayed low enough to ensure the safety of, for human consumption. But now lots and lots of people use these. Actually, just as a side story, I was at um, the Wetlands Institute, which is in the coast of New Jersey. And they use these little eye button buttons to monitor the temperature of the eggs of the turtles um, because the sex of turtles is determined by the temperature at which they're incubating, which I thought was very interesting. But when you pulled out these eye buttons, I was like, I know what these are, those are. Tell me how you use them for your, your research. And uh, so lots and lots of people use these now. They record data depending on what you want them to do. We record it every 10 minutes. You can set it higher or lower than that. And we end up with about 14 days of data on there. The point of all of this is to show you that we had a nice smattering of storm sizes over the time that we did this monitoring. So we had some big, we had some little. And so I think it's a nice representative uh, snapshot of what you can expect from one of these stormwater control measures as far as their ability to control temperature. This is a busy plot, but I can hopefully deconstruct it a little bit for you. Uh, what you see here, this is the uh, precipitation up at the top, right? So that's over on this side. And then um, what we have also is we have the bed emptying over time, right? So that's what's going on here. The bed fills up and then it empties out. So that's what we would expect to see. And kind of the big take home message here is that when we look at the temperature of the water that's coming in, right, so we take a look at those values, they're pretty darn high, and
and the bed temperature stays the same. That's kind of the big take home message from this, is that the, te the bed temperature does not increase um, because all of the stone is able to absorb that heat from that hot front off that's coming in. If we take those outflow measurements and we compare them to uh, what we would expect for that cold water fishery, warm water fishery, and trout fishery, um, we see that where we're at is not quite good enough to be considered a cold water fishery, but um, much better than it was before, right? So if we take a look at um, the average runoff temperature, uh, it's up here, right? So pretty darn high, and we're able to cool it down quite a bit. Another way of looking at that same data is if we kind of combine everything together, this one might be a little easier to look at, is that we see the range on the surface temperature as we would expect to be quite big, and we see the range of the bed temperature to be quite small. So to kind of wrap it up, um, we found that these beds are actually really effective at controlling temperature. I think in the urban environment, this is a really nice finding, because one of the things that we found is that the water doesn't have to be in the bed long to see this big reduction in temperature. So if your goal was just to reduce temperature, and you didn't even want infiltration to occur, you could just run the water over these stone beds, and the water exiting out the other side would be much cooler because of this heat transfer that's going on. All right, so this is uh, all the folks that supported this work, and I'm going to hand it over to 